This is Ivy Unleashed, a Gold Ivy production. Okay, and life for you now. You have a lot going on. Obviously, keynote. We know that you're a parent. You're dating. Uh, we also know that you're tapping into some stand-up comedy. All kinds of things. Oh, so yeah. what is life like for you now with all the different games you're playing in? Life is appropriately full. That's how I, 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 there's certain words I choose to avoid in my own vernacular because they have a negative emotional connotation with me. You guys struck one of them earlier, which is grind. Uh, I don't ever want to be associated with the word grind. There's nothing I do in my life that I grind through. Do I work really hard? Absolutely. And I'm proud of that work ethic. But the, the word grind doesn't work for me. Doesn't mean it's a bad word. I have friends that use it and it's very empowering and it up and, what and they it love it. What does it bring up in you? I'm just curious. Like I just picture somebody white knuckling, gritting their teeth and, oh, I got to do, I don't Hating have to do anything. I get to do everything in my life. I don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm very, very thankful and, and fortunate that. So the other one is busy. I'm not busy. I'm appropriately full because I choose my schedule and I choose what I put on my calendar. Um, busy means I'm doing other people's agendas and other people's work and it feels frantic. Uh, now there are times where I don't do a masterful job of being appropriately full and I start to feel overwhelmed and busy. And then I learned to, to, to take a step back. But, um, right now, you know, there's a couple things about that. I've learned about myself that I use to design my life. First is I'm heavily introverted. I love solitude. I love alone time. That is where I recharge. When we were talking earlier, you guys asked if I enjoyed my, my day yesterday with nothing on the schedule in Minneapolis. I did. Cause I didn't see another human being. I stayed by myself. I ordered Uber Eats to my room. I got some work done. I rehearsed for my keynote, got a great night rest so that I could hopefully bring the fire to you guys this morning. And I loved it. I quarantined myself off from all of society because I needed that day to recharge. So I know that I'm introverted, which means today I'm with you guys for a couple hours in the morning. Then I'm with that group for several hours and I have to be on the entire time. The moment dinner is over tonight, I cannot wait to get back to my hotel room take a shower, order some Uber Eats and watch something mindless on TV before I go to sleep, wake up and take a flight home. But I've learned that about myself. And I've learned that if I don't find times to recharge my battery, then tomorrow when I go home and I see my kids, I'm not the best version of myself. I'll be irritable. I'll be grumpy. So I've, I've learned in between speaking engagements and in between childcare and, and just to make sure we're clear. So I'm very amicably divorced. I was married for five years. I've been divorced for seven. My ex and I are great friends. We get along great. We make great co-parents, but I've learned that the times I don't have my children, I need to refill my tank. The times I'm not speaking, I need to refill my tank. So one introversion Two, I love structure. I love routine. I love consistency. I'm almost militaristic to the point that I like to schedule things out. Um, I'm trying to learn to be more flexible and spontaneous because I know that, that, that not everyone operates uh, the same way that I do. We're all using a slightly different operating system. So I never want to be rigid. I want to be able to, to be adaptable, but I, I like structure. So knowing that I'm introverted and knowing I like structure is kind of how I design my my life and my schedule. And then I only put things on my schedule that are taking me closer to who I'm trying to be and what I'm trying to achieve. So I don't fill my schedule up with things that, that aren't meaningful to me. Um, doesn't mean every single moment of every day is rainbows and puppy dogs and ice cream. Yes. Some things have to get done in order to allow me to do the things that I really love to do and find meaning in. But generally speaking, those are kind of the quadrants of my life. I've got my children, which is an incredibly important part of my life. I have my work where I find tremendous meaning. I have things that I'm really interested in doing. And a lot of them are, are training for physical events. And then I make room for relationships or dating. And I told you, I'm taking a little break from dating at the moment, getting off of the dating apps. Cause I just, I need a recharge and a reset. You know, I, I need to, to stop swiping for a few moments and <laughs> just take a couple deep funnier. breaths. Yes. If I could improve my humor, then maybe I could attract a life partner. But until then, um, the buses are just going to keep going by. But you are, then. you are working on <laughs> your humor by doing stand-up. Yes. So tell us about that. Absolutely. So I like having something on my schedule two to three to six months out that I look forward to and that I'm training for. Um, in the past, I've done a Spartan race, an ultra marathon, hike rim to rim at the Grand Canyon. I just did a Navy SEAL training event. So almost everything that I've done in the last two years has been for the physical. Now, there's also a mental and emotional component to those things, but it's primarily physical. I have to physically be in shape enough to do this thing. 
But now I'm going to try my hand at doing uh, some open mic nights in the D.C. area and try some stand-up comedy, which won't take any type of physical preparation, but it'll certainly take some mental and emotional um, preparation as well. And I'm looking forward to it. I've been a huge fan of stand-up comedy, not just because I like to laugh. I, I think most people enjoy laughing, but I've always studied the craft of it. I've been mesmerized by, by really good stand-up comedians. Um, I think this is, I'm heavily biased. It is the purest form uh, of spoken word that there is. It is you and a microphone, no props, no slides, nothing else. And you need to make a group of random, usually intoxicated people who are expecting to laugh and have paid money to laugh. You need to make them laugh. I don't know that there's a harder job when it comes to being an orator. So, well, Especially when you're an introverted, structured guy. Like, <laughs> yeah. This is like the opposite of what I would picture you doing. Yeah. So it, it is going to take me out of my comfort zone. And, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, the, the biggest challenge for me, and I'll make this public... What I find the funniest is incredibly off color and politically incorrect. Like the comedians that I gravitate towards who make me belly laugh, say some pretty raunchy stuff. That's just the, the sense of humor I have. So I also need to toe a fine line of, you know, I, I am a father. I want to be respected in the community. I take my work very serious. So I, I don't want to do anything that could tarnish my brand. So I'm a little bit in limbo. And it's not that I don't think that, mm -hmm. that there, it's possible to be funny and be clean at the same time. I just know what makes me laugh. And for me to be truly authentic and, and pure, I can go to some dark places. And so that it's going to take some nuanced skill to do some of these things. But I'm looking forward to it. Now, I, as I told you guys, you only see a small part of the snapshot. So what most people see is Alan said he's going to try some stand-up comedy. He's going to sign up for some open mic nights. And then a month later, he's going to actually do it. Wow, he's pretty courageous. I can't believe he's doing that. I started telling myself this 10 years ago. So it's taken 9.8 years for me to get the courage to actually pull the trigger and do it. So that goes back to the six no's for every one yes. You know, I've been sitting on this forever. I wanted to try my hand at stand-up comedy in my mid-30s, and I'm now, you know, staring down the barrel of 50, and I'm going to finally give it a try. So it's taken some time. But what I realized was what was holding me back was I never set the date. Mm. You know, if I say on this date I have to be prepared for a 26-hour Navy SEAL challenge, then I have to be prepared. There ain't no backing out of that. Yep. But I always just gave myself an out. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try some open mics next month. And then it never comes around. So that was why I put that out on social and why I'm saying it on programs like this. It's the ultimate accountability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't back out now because there's no way I'm looking all those people in the eye and saying I chickened out. So I'm going to do it. But because I love preparation and structure. So I've already gone to several open mic nights and I've scouted them out because I wanted to see what the room feels like. I want to see what the audience is like. Not that I'm competing with anyone else, but I want to see the level of open micer. And uh, let's just say I'll be okay. <laughs> I'm going to be okay. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be offering any Netflix specials to the people that go to these open mics. So I like my chances, um, but it's going to be fun. But here, here's what's fascinating. So we mentioned earlier when I said I was struggling a little bit during that workout downstairs because I'm not in hit type of shape right now. I'm in long distance, steady running shape. Um, and that was good. That was why it was awesome for me to do that. Well, even from a speaking standpoint, today you guys will see me speak for 60 minutes and I'll barely take a breath and won't miss a syllable. And then I'll be on a panel for 60 minutes and we'll have notes. So I can do two hours standing on my head. And yet coming up with four minutes of stand up material is going to be really challenging. Wow. That's going to be really hard. And I'm looking forward to it. Now, I, I like the science and the art, like the craft of it. So um, I don't, I'm not going to wing it. That was one of the things that when I noticed these other open micers, I felt like they were just kind of getting up there and winging mm -hmm. it. I don't believe in doing that. I believe time is our most precious resource and our attention in the present moment is the number one currency we have to play. And I don't believe in wasting people's time or attention. So I'm not implying that I'm going to be super funny for four minutes. What I can promise you is I'll be prepared Whatever I do up there, I will have planned to say, I will have rehearsed it. Now, whether the audience thinks it's funny is out of my control, right. but it won't, be, it won't be from lack of preparation. And I do that because I respect the audience. And I respect that if you're going to put your eyes on me for four straight minutes, that I owe you the best that I'm capable of. And anything less than that, I think is disrespectful. So I'm, I will give it my best. And then it'll be interesting because the keynote speaking and stand up, the feedback is real time. 
If I'm not funny, it will be inherently <laughs> awkward while I'm standing You're there. Sit in that. Yes. <laughs> and the crickets or the but, but, laughter. But that goes back to learning how to be okay with that. That's mm-hmm. one of the reasons I'm doing it is I want to strengthen that muscle. Uh, you know, you guys will see in my keynote today. Now, nothing in my keynote is supposed to be like, ha ha ha, this guy's really funny. But there are a few things I say that usually elicit a decent chuckle or a smile or, you know, like you want to add a little bit of humor to it, but I do maybe six things that are kind of funny over a 60 minute keynote. So that's one every 10 minutes in stand up comedy. You need a laugh every 10 seconds. That's a, that's a different speed. Wow. So in four minutes, I got to pack a pretty good punch and uh, it's going to be interesting. But the other thing is I also recognize this is not going to be a one and done. I'm not doing one four minute open mic and then not doing it again. I'm going to sign up for probably eight to 10 of them right off the bat because whatever I do that first time is going to be the worst that I'll ever do. Like that's the rite of passage. Mm -hmm. I can tell you right now, the first keynote I ever gave was the worst keynote I've ever given. Now there've been a couple bumps in the road since then, but generally speaking, the trend is working towards improvement. So why would I make a permanent decision based on the fact that I know going into it that my first four minutes is going to be my worst? Now, the next time I sign up, that four minutes should be a little better. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go from the worst to the white Dave Chappelle in, in mm-hmm. you know, one transition, but can I make it a little bit better? And this also goes back to the listening. So I do four minutes and I don't get the response that I want. So that's the audience's way of telling me that's not very funny to us. So then I need to figure out, was it the timing? Was it the material? Uh, should the, the joke I did at the end, should I have done it at the beginning? Um, should I, you know, ch- should I use a different word? So maybe this word wasn't as funny. Yeah. So it's, there's going to be some fun to it. So my goal, assuming this goes well, is to craft four minutes and to keep working on that four minute block until I feel like that four minutes is pretty decent. And then I'll shelve that and I'll start over with a new four minutes. And then I'll do the same process. My goal is to see if I can build up 20 to 25 minutes of pretty good material that I could maybe one day be like the third opener at a local comedy club. So, so graduate from open mics to doing something and we shall see. And then the last thing I'll say is I've had so many people, uh, friends in the area say, well, let us know when you're going to do it so we can come support you. And I said, no way, because I want to, I appreciate the support. And that is very kind and thoughtful of you to reach out, but I don't need any pity laughs. I want to earn every laugh Mm -hmm. so that I know that if my four minutes, if people are laughing, those are genuine laughs. You know, I don't want a bunch of people there making me feel good over time. Yeah. Once I do get that Netflix special, you guys can be there for the taping, but for the first four minutes, I want to earn all of it. So I'm not telling anyone, I won't know a soul when I walk in, I'll sign up, I'll do my four minutes and we'll see what happens. Oh, I can't wait. Two things. One, that's on um, doing it step by step and getting better 1% every time. Two, we dibs on being the VIP guests. Oh, for absolutely. For that, <laughs> that's week. You guys will certainly get the invite. So, okay. So here's my, my, my real plan too. So I used to, and I didn't do it this time, um, prior to the pandemic, like I, I like barbershop culture. There's something about going to, to tradi- not like salons, and I've been to plenty of those. I'm a little fancy boy. but We can tell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I get my nails did. Um, I, I like barbershop culture. There, there, there's, there's just something about it. So what I used to do is when I would travel before the pandemic, uh, I would always find a local barber, and I would get a skin fade or whatever my hairstyle was at that time, and I would find an auth- not, not a super cuts or any, any type of franchise, but a legitimate down home barber. And I just enjoyed doing that. So Mm -hmm. every time before every speaking engagement, the night before I would get my hair cut. So now my goal is to switch that in every city I go to find if there is an open mic and then start doing that and just making that part of my routine. It'll get me out of my hotel room and ordering Uber eats. It'll actually inject me into society and be amongst the people. Uh, it will allow me to try my craft in different places, I just think it'll be fun to do. Yeah. And most major cities will have some type of option. So that's going to be my plan is the night before I speak, you know, warm up the old pipes with a little uh, stand up comedy and then go through my pre-speaking routine the next morning and do my thing. So love that. uh, that's going to be the goal. So we'll see. I'll keep you guys posted. That's awesome. I love the accountability you have with yourself and yes. putting it out there too. And you don't want people to come to those, but we do want people to know where to find you and you are literally everywhere. So let's talk about where people can get your book, where they can follow you, where they can find you. Uh, AllensteinJr.com is the primary hub and that's for anyone interested in anything speaking related. 
Uh, and then I have a supplemental site, strongerteam.com, uh, which has info on the podcast, the books. I have an online course and I do some one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, I'm very accessible and responsive on social media. So at Alan Stein Jr. on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, and then you can find Raise Your Game or Sustain Your Game on Amazon or Audible or wherever you get your books and audio books. Uh, if any part of this conversation resonated, if someone wants to ask a question, if someone wants to share a thought, uh, please shoot me a DM on Instagram. Um, would love to keep the conversation going. Love answering questions. And, and, and don't forget, being introverted means that's where I derive energy. It doesn't mean I don't like people. It doesn't mean I'm antisocial. There's nothing I would rather be doing than this conversation and then going to do a keynote. All I'm saying is at the end of that, I will be exhausted and I need to recharge. So I love engaging with people. I appreciate people. I appreciate you two very much. This was so much fun. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. Oh, we're so grateful you're here and we get to hang out with you. All day. Watch you do your thing even more. So for everyone listening, two steps. First step is go follow Alan online on Instagram. Or in person. Or Just in person. follow me around. It's borderline <laughs> creepy, but help yourself. <laughs> if you want to set up a blind date, message us and we'll set it up. Seriously. No, but first step is follow him. Second step is get this book. Raise your game and sustain your game. Will completely change your game and up level your life. We cannot recommend it enough. Mm -hmm. And we want some more gold from you. So, Alan, your three gold stars for our audience. These are your three takeaways. What are your three gold stars? Whatever it is that you're trying to up-level in your life, figure out what the basic building blocks are, the fundamentals of that specific area, get crystal clear on what they are, and then work relentlessly towards improving them and mastering them during the unseen hours. This is true in, in being uh, for your relationship. This is true for being a parent. This is true for any skill, any vocation. Get crystal clear on the basics and work relentlessly towards those, um, I would say, is one. Uh, number two, get crystal clear on the person that you're trying to become. So not, not your to-do list, not what you're trying to check off, not external uh, accolades or, or achievements. Who do you want to become? And then make sure the decisions you make in the present are in alignment with becoming that person. But don't try to bat a thousand. Don't aim for perfection. Not everything you do or say is going to be in alignment with who you're trying to become. Uh, so give yourself some grace. And lastly, I guess I'll piggyback on that. Uh, you're not broken. Uh, you are worthy. Just, just do the best you can with what you have wherever you are. Uh, don't blame, complain, or make excuses. Hold yourself fully accountable. And just know wherever you are, you're not alone. We're all going through the struggle. We're all challenged. We're all facing adversity. Um, so, so be okay with that. Lean into that uh, instead of trying to avoid it or think anything's wrong with you. You're definitely not broken. God, it's like you're a motivational speaker or something. <laughs> I, need, I need to be today at 1.30. <laughs> Up next is Unleashing Ivy. So these are three rapid fire surprise questions for you. Ooh. Before we get into it, I just want to say thank you so much for this book, um, for your podcast, for your other book, for the message that you're putting into the world. And the biggest thing that I keep thinking about is you are a male and everything we're talking about is mental health and there's so much stigma around it. And so I'm grateful that you're on our podcast as a voice of a male who digs deep, who thinks about what they want out of life and normalizes everything you're saying. Like you're not alone in this. And to keep thinking about the man that you want to be or the person you want to be and that we all beat ourselves up, right? But you're clearly someone that's done therapy and you're okay with talking about it. And so I'm just grateful that you as the male that you are with the success you've had, that you've really digged into how important your mental health is. Thank you. I have a therapy appointment next week. <laughs> I go in for regular tune-ups. Hey, you take your car in to get the oil changed and the tires rotated. We got to do the same thing for that's ourselves. So but no, I appreciate your kind words very much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And we like predominantly have females on this podcast, but I think, you know, we, we love raising male voices too, especially those that are in touch with how important this is to talk about. So, uh, my Unleashing Ivy question has to do with, um, you kind of growing up and you as a parent now and how you kind of take these fundamentals and this focus on, you know, doing your best, but having that grace, how were you raised and how is that affecting you as a parent now? I love my parents very much and recognize they did the best they were capable of at the time, but I parent my children very differently than how I was raised. And really everything that we talked about today, I have or will talk about with my children very openly. So all of these concepts, um, from a parenting standpoint, I believe in modeling the behavior I want to see my children emulate. 
So they may tell you slightly differently, but I don't give them a whole lot of lectures. Every once in a while, they're like, dad, you sound like you're doing one of your keynotes. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, understood. But I just try to model it. You know, I can go home and talk to my kids till I'm blue in the face about the importance of being respectful, or they can just see me being respectful to everything and everyone that I interact with on a daily basis. So I, I model that for them. I don't have a lot of rules with my children. I believe in letting my children make the vast majority of their decisions, but making sure they understand um, you make the choice, you suffer the consequence. I'm not going to bail you out on that. So if you choose not to go out and practice every single day and then you get cut from the basketball team, I'll still have compassion for you and I'll love you unconditionally. Whether you make the basketball team or not has nothing to do with whether I love you. But I'm here to tell you that if you want to make the basketball team, there are things you can do to increase the chance that that happens. And I'm happy to show you what those things are if you'd like, or you can figure it out on your own. You're a own. good resource for figuring out what to do on a basketball to, court. Try to, but, but, that's, but that's also the funny part because my kids are approaching the age where they're not going to want to hear that from me anymore because I'm dad. Mm -hmm. What does dumb old dad know? And I'm okay with that. You know, I already have coaches and trainers that, that work with my children because I believe it takes a village and I want other people to pour into my kids. I want them to hear other voices. I don't want to be the only voice they hear. I want to make sure they know when they hear mine, it's because it's important. Um, but I don't, I don't want that, them to tune that out. So, um, yeah, from a parenting standpoint, I do parent very differently. And, uh, and that's not an admonishment of my parents. They did what they could do with the tools they had and mine's different. And that's the other thing about parenting. I have a wonderful deep connection with each of my children right now, but I have no idea whether I'm doing this well or not. And I won't until they're a little bit older. And uh, so, yeah, we shall see. But I love being a father. Yeah. It, it's a tricky balance of, you know, I'm doing my best with what I know, you know, but I, I panic all the time about whether I'm doing things right. Because there are things that our parents did that we wish were different, right? Sure. But also you coming from where you came from, you are, you have a great mindset and you do, like, you are so respectful, like just being with you for a few hours, like you model that you for sure are doing that. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Well, well the, the things that we talked about, the, the previous Alan and the current Alan, I'm incredibly open and transparent and vulnerable with my own children about that mm -hmm. and, and let them know, you know, when I, uh, when I talk about the glory days of me being a player back in the day, it's never to tell them how good I was because I wasn't that good of a player. It's to share them, share with them the mistakes I made. And when I got to college, I had an awful attitude that as soon as I stopped getting meaningful minutes, I blamed the coach. I made excuses. I went out and partied a lot. Like I, when there was a fork in the road, I could have chosen the path of I'm going to get in the gym, work my tail off and earn the right to play more minutes. But it was much easier for me to say the coach is an idiot. He doesn't like me. I'll just go out and party. So I, I explained that to my children. So um, I'm very vulnerable with them. When I do make mistakes, which is all of the time, I acknowledge them. Um, if I'm a little grouchy and I, I, you know, snap at one of my kids, then I apologize and say, Hey, that wasn't because of anything you did. I'm having a little bit of a lousy day, but I'm allowed to have a lousy day. And I appreciate you giving me some grace. I'm not perfect as a father. I'm going to F up, but that's, that's part of the journey. And just know as a kid, you're going to F up a lot and I'm still going to love you and I'm still going to have your back and that's going to be okay. We'll figure this out together. Love that. My question is about the legacy that you want to leave behind. What is it? Legacy is such a fascinating word because I can go in so many different directions. The first thing I think of is my kids, you know, um, with this concept of lighting as many candles as I can, there's no better way to do that than to put three human beings in the world that are kind, compassionate, tolerant, uh, self-assured, um, have high emotional intelligence and contribute something to the world. I mean, if nothing else, hopefully multiply my impact by three. So um, that's part of it. You know, I would hope that anything that I share uh, on stage or anything that I put in my books, if, if folks find helpful and it's just a little piece of the jigsaw puzzle of their life and it adds some value, maybe that will be part of it. But um, yeah, I, I don't spend a ton of time thinking about legacy. Most of my time is thinking about the present moment and how can I add as much value to the lives around me and to my own life as I can. And then I'll let somebody else sort that out. Um, <clears throat> I do think about my own mortality a lot, uh, not necessarily in a morbid way, but I think it's somewhat healthy, you know, that, you know, we, we keep talking about buses as if I'm referencing them as if they're females. So we'll use it in a different context here. If, if after my keynote, I walk outside and I get hit by a bus and this thing is all over today, you know, 
who's going to show up at my funeral? Who's going to be a part? Well, since I'm in Minneapolis, you two better be there. Yeah. You you guys (laughs) can walk on the red carpet. No, it's actually hilarious. Um, Like that's when I think you find out who who did you really make an impact on, you know, because it's uh, most people do what's most convenient for them in their life at that moment. But I think, you know, whether you call it a funeral or a celebration of life, gives you a little bit of a yardstick of, of maybe some of the people that you've had a chance to impact and, and so forth. So, so we'll see. So really long answer made considerably concise. My main legacy will be my children. I'll let others sort everything else out whenever my time here has passed. Yeah. I think that present moment idea with the most you can do in that is what creates the legacy. Mm-hmm. You know. All right. Last question. What is one thing you wish you would have known sooner? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Loaded question. That I'm enough. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> would have figured that out. That would have, uh, you know, fast forward 40 years. But yeah. And, and that comes from a place of humility, not a place of self-righteousness. To just know that everything that we've talked about where I can openly acknowledge that I was somewhat deficient previously, you know, scarcity mindset, not very patient, very selfish, like all of those things all rooted from not feeling enough. So if I would have known that then, I probably could have sidestepped many of those behaviors. However, every single one of those behaviors put me literally in this incredibly uncomfortable chair sitting here right now with you guys uh, during this, this podcast. So one of the words that I've, I've always been really interested in and a um, gentleman named, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dan Pink's work, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of his books. He's written some am- amazing books. His most recent book was about the power of regret. And that regret is actually a good thing because it gets you to change your behavior moving forward. And, and, and I certainly concur with that. So all of these things that I can say kind of tongue in cheek with a smile that I maybe didn't handle very eloquently earlier in life has taught me a lesson and has put me where I am right now. So it's that butterfly effect. You change any of that stuff and I'm not where I am right now, both literally and metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And I'm very thankful for where I am literally and metaphorically. So I don't necessarily need to change anything. I've learned some painful lessons. I've been really hard headed. I've done, done and said some stupid things, but they've all put me where I am now. And I have a great life right now. So for that, I'm incredibly thankful. Would you change though, the chair you're sitting on though, if you could? Oh, absolutely. And if I ever come back to do this, if it's a BYOC, bring your own chair, I may need to do that or at least get one of those donuts that I can sit on. But, uh, No, this has been incredibly enjoyable. You guys are phenomenal. I've loved every second of this chair or no chair. This was, this was tremendous. Thank you both so much. Thank you. We started this podcast and our name gold Ivy gold. We want to be a light for others. You do too. And you're doing the damn thing. So thank you for your time. We know it's incredibly valuable, full of gold, full of wisdom. So everyone go follow Alan and a little more gold, a little more wisdom. We leave our listeners with a quote, a piece of gold. Would you like to share yours? So a quote, um, boy, I am a bona fide quote nerd. I love quotes. I think in quotes every time I hear quotes, um, the way words are arranged. Uh, One of my favorite is, and I think is very poignant to this discussion, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So you got to lean in and make the change. This is Gold Ivy signing off. Listen to your truth and go chase your gold.